to the podcast where we introduce you to incredible humans who share their journeys with the mission to inspire you to harness your own inner tenacity to drive your life and career forward. And now, your host, Adam Posner. We are back. We are back. And the day rolls on. Well, welcome. We're back here at day two at HR Tech. I'm joined by Lydia Wu. Welcome. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here and thank you, Hire Road, for having this. So before we dig in, tell us who you are and what you do best. Ooh, professionally. Okay, I was like, how long do you have for that story? We have about 25 <laughs> minutes, yes. <laughs> All right, so I have spent the last 15 years in the HR tech ecosystem. I started out as a consultant. I would argue I'm still a recovering consultant at this stage. Mm-hmm. Spent about seven years working as an industry HR executive and recently pivoted over to the solution provider side of the house. So what I do best is providing the real talk on the full 360 of the ecosystem, whether you are a buyer, a solution provider, or just someone who's looking to get more familiar Mm -hmm. with what's going on in HR tech, what the heck does AI actually mean? What are my actual Mm -hmm. challenges? Who do I buy? How do I buy? How much do I spend? I am basically your real talk BFF, if you will, to go for all of that. (laughs) This is exactly, let's have some real talk. Okay, let's do it. My show is all about real talk because I think it's really important in this space too. And we've just seen a transformation, I'd say in the last 15 years of what HR means as a practice. Um, a lot of people out there still think that HR in general are the narcs or the cops or the corporate cops over there, but there's so yeah. much more to it. And if you work in an organization where you have a great HR team, you know it. And I talk about my, I spent some time in American Express about 15 years ago. Okay. And I talk about the quality of HR and the benefits and the way they take care of their people and look out for them. It's also important for everyone to delineate that HR is not TA. Recruiting oh and yes. HR are different functions and, and they should be, but going back 15 years, a lot yeah. of companies HR, that's how they hire there. As we stand right here in the middle, towards the end of 2024, what is the biggest thorn in the industry side right now? Oh my gosh, so many thorns. Let we me- We can get into a couple of I know, I was like, do I this, really have to pick the biggest one? This rose has a lot of thorns. <laughs> So I think the biggest one for me, and it's really unfortunate to see, is the regression of HR as a strategic partner to the business. And during the pandemic era, essentially, if you think about it, people needed HR because they're trying to figure out how to go remote and fast forward a decade in under a month. What do I do? Who do I talk to? How do I fix things? How do I get it? My boss isn't responding, right? So many new issues. Exactly. And HR as a function was just catapulted to be the right-hand side of the CEO of a lot of business leaders. And it was phenomenal to see over the course of the two, three years during that time. But fortunate or unfortunate for HR during that time is we weren't really trying to prove our ROI. It was the fact that we took on a lot of money, we took on a lot of investments, we bought a lot of cool technology. That's when you start to see a lot of the unicorn evaluations in the HR tech side of the house as well. But that ROI was lacking. And now fast forward to the macro environment that we're working in now where the cost of borrowing is a bit high, to say the least. True. All of a sudden, CEOs are like, okay, I got to cut. What am I going to cut? I can't, I got to keep the business afloat. So I'm sorry, but like employee engagement may have to take a secondary seat. And that is the biggest thorn in my side right now, because I see a lot of passionate HR professionals, a lot of passionate TA professionals who are being told, I'm sorry, I can't do this. I'm sorry, I can't do this. You got to do more with less. You got to do more with less. And oh, by the way, maybe do AI, figure it out. We're going to get to AI go from there. there. So I think that's the biggest challenge for me right now. What's interesting, let's talk about the pandemic for a moment. It's a time capsule Mm -hmm. and it was a curveball that no one saw coming. And I'm an in-the-trenches recruiter at a recruiting firm. And I work with companies that were fully remote pre-pandemic and companies that that like many others had a pivot in March of 2020. And it's just a fascinating, it's fascinating to see both of them side by side and how they, the ones that are fully remote before keep the culture and the ones that had to adapt. Mm -hmm. Some of them did it well, which is a real testament to the executive team being able to lead yeah. and the team being able to take that and, and run with it. How did you help companies during this transition shift to that remote work, either in two sides, the, the people yeah. side and the tech side? For sure. Like a 10 part question. <laughs> so I think on the tech side, it was really teaching people how to be directionally accurate. The one thing I think that's a detrimental flaw in HR and a lot of business leaders is that we gun for the 100%. We don't take a risk until we know something's 100%. Mm. When you work in an environment of HR tech and just HR in the modern world as we live in, it's hard to nail 100%, if not impossible. So basically, the mantra I've been teaching everyone was like, 7 0 and go. Get it to the 70% confident mark, have a 30% unknown, and just pivot and iterate in action that 30%. over perfection. 
Absolutely. It's my motto. So I think that part is what's taken from a perfection of the remote work policy perspective mm -hmm. in terms of get it to 70%, directionally figure out where you want to go, what are the lines you don't want to cross, and just roll with it. And from the technology front, it's also the same thing. Find providers that are going to be your partners who are going to be there when you need a midnight text of, oh crap, my implementation is not going well, but simultaneously who doesn't have to assure you 100% of the results that you're going to achieve, of the outcome of the implementation effort, because realistically, no one can assure that to the 90th or 100th percent percentile. How are you coaching in the consultancy role? How are you coaching your clients on finding the right partner? Because if you walk this floor here, there's a mm -hmm. lot of products that look and sound and feel the same. Yes. And it's dating, right? It's not the right fit it's for- It's like a Tinder. Right? <laughs> swipe, swipe. Yeah, exactly. What are some of those best practices for organizations, too big, too small now, right? The Goldilocks kind of syndrome? Yeah, absolutely. I think the one thing I would always tell them is whatever your problem is, just rest assured that this marketplace is diverse enough that there is a solution out there for you guaranteed. The challenge is how much marketing money does that solution have and how much digging you have to do as an organization to figure it out. And before all of that, what's the problem that you're trying to solve? Because I feel like it's very easy to get distracted in the Goldilocks case of, of what is Papa Bear doing, what is Mama Bear doing, and everything else in between, as opposed to figuring out what is real for me in the moment. Do I really need that leading edge tech platform, or is just something that does the job good yeah. enough? What's your portfolio mix, right? And that leads me into the, the next two things I want to talk about, which is data analytics, and that leads right into the, our favorite topic, AI. Yes. So I want to start with data and analytics. How much is too much where it becomes process paralysis versus using it as directional, informative to make decisions? Yeah, for sure. I think <clears throat> the challenge with HR and data is that we have a overabundance of possibly useless data that we forgot like how to structure. I tell people, I'm like, you know the whole Marie Kondo thing on Netflix? Go watch it. Think about how you're going to apply that to your data because we ask people, what's your favorite color? What's your pet name? Like all of the other things, which I'm like, this is phenomenal. I love to know that Twix is your favorite chocolate bar. That doesn't help me predict your performance outcome. No. That doesn't help me do much with your data. And then the way we store it, because we jerry rig so many tech systems together, the data stack are sitting everywhere that to marry your ATS data, for example, to your candidate data, to possibly your sourcing data, and to your performance management data, which we know is a full cycle, it's near impossible if you've just duct taped one solution after the other without thinking about what is that final outcome. So I think that's challenge number one, the data architecture and the solution duct taping. Challenge number two is we implement solutions before we think about the story we want to tell. Yes. I always tell people, I'm like, before you do anything, think about sitting in the room with your CEO a year from now. What is that story that you're going to tell him or her? And they're going to be like, yes, phenomenal job. Here's your annual bonus. I'm going to double that amount. How do we do that? How do we get to that point? <laughs> Figure out that story and then think about the data points you want to share in that story and then think about your platform and what you're going to measure with your platform because now you're starting with the end in mind and everything becomes a lot clearer. This is a real talk we need right now. <laughs> so I was at, were you at Sherm this year? I was not. So I was having lunch with our show producer, Melinda, and we're sitting above the, the conference room floor and I'm just staring out into this vast abyss yes. of vendors <laughs> out there. And I, I saw this like kind of matrix moment with AI over everything. AI, I, it's enough of the AI already. It's like kale. Remember kale like five years ago? Everything had like kale I mean, like on kale, it. I guess. <laughs> then let's kale. So everything AI, not, first of all, keep me straight here. Not everything needs to have AI. You don't need to use AI, but we also need to define what AI means because it's so broad stroke right yes. now. And companies are just AI washing. I'd say, yeah, did I just find that AI washing? <laughs> You can use it. I was like, I'm going to borrow that are for we, my next blog. Are we AI washing? Yeah. This is, are we AI washing? Let's get into it with Lydia Wu on the pause. Yes. So yes, we are absolutely AI washing. So here's a little bit of real talk from the vendor side of the house where I don't think a lot of practitioners see, right? Fundamentally speaking, given where the market trend reports are, AI is what gets me into meeting rooms. But I assure you, AI is not what is being signed in that final contract. It's almost like people are attracted to the shiny and then they mm -hmm. buy the practical. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think about it as a buyer perspective, and this is like a key moment for everyone, real talk, if I'm only having something for you in the name of shiny. Realistically, how much money am I going to put into that shiny once that shiny is no longer shiny? And what are you going to do if you're really betting on the shiny part being your act 
actual practical solution? I think that's a question everyone needs to ask themselves. And I think the other part of it too is AI has been around since the 1940s, 1950s. I, feel, I don't know it's how many called, times I had the conversation. Yes. Like literally the term artificial intelligence was like coined back in 1956. It's computer machine learning. Exactly. It's processing different speeds, data it's analytics, and form. It's been around. What we're seeing now, the AI washing, is like the kale chips. Before kale became a thing, it was a salad bar decoration at right. Pizza Hut. Before AI became a thing in the marketing world and in the HR tech world, it's essentially the technology that powered most of the technology we use. We just never talked about it that way. The podcast would like to thank High Road for supporting this series of episodes recorded live at HR Tech in Las Vegas this September. Higher Road is a leading global provider of HR software driven by People Insight, our best in class people analytics solution. People Insight by Higher Road delivers implementation in under one week. It's a suite of intuitive dashboard visualizations to make sense of your disparate HR data and a team of analysts to support you every step of the way. They provide a transparent, cost-effective approach to meet companies where they are at in their people and data journey. And for more info, please visit higherroad.com forward slash pause, P-O-Z. Thanks. My hot take, and it's not the first time I've said this, is companies use it, need to use it as a tool and not a crutch. Oh, absolutely. And be very mindful, especially in the HR and TA space, is to make the practitioner's jobs more efficient and effective so they could put more time into the human side oh, of it. Where are you seeing some of the best uses of AI tools? So some of the applications. Okay, on the personal front, I'm gonna share this with Please. you. It's settling a argument with your spouse. So last week, my husband and I got into this. Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. I, I love this. There we go. <laughs> so last week my husband and I got into this. What is the difference between a shrimp and a prom? Do you know this? <laughs> Is it the number of, of legs? Is it? No. I mean, that's my educated guess. It's the ecosystem. So I think prawns are from rivers or the other way I around. I want saltwater, one freshwater, right? Exactly. Well, brackish if you're in New Orleans area, okay. right? So my husband and I are very dorky. We get into these conversations all the time, and we usually take 30 minutes to settle them, assuming we don't get into a whole argument. And but there's no sidebar fights. Exactly. Last week, it was like 10 seconds, chat GPT, here's your answer. Okay, we're moving right along with our lives. So it's these, these little incremental efficiencies on the personal front, and taking it to the professional front, think about the last email that you had to draft, or think about the last policy that you had to draft, or the candidate communication right. you had to draft. How long did it take you to brainstorm all of that? How long did it take you to figure out if Canada is being really tough and negotiating salary, and I know I can't push it, what's the angle I'm going in with? Now picture someone giving you like a 70% their script already. You're like, I just got to tweak it. I got to personalize it. Great. Send button. Off we go. That's what so I use these it for. little things. That's, uh, that's what I use it for. And a lot of it is re repetition. So you, exactly. you have the core basis of a communication, but now you're putting in inputs for tone specifics. For example, I've actually used a tool recently for, I beta tested a tool for salary negotiation. Yeah. It was fantastic. And it takes a lot of the contentiousness out of yeah. it. And the tool also had elements of, okay, if we can't give you this, could we give you a sign on bonus? Could we give you extra equity, more exactly. equity? What are you subconsciously valuing that you're not telling me right now that I can really get into? Interesting. So let, let's get a little bit more qualitative here. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about candidate experience because that's a thorn in my side. I work yes. with a lot of companies. I bet. <laughs> and it's a tough one because it doesn't mean they're bad people or a bad company when you're having a bad experience. Yeah. It's process. And people need to understand that it's not the person's fault, the recruiter, but they do represent the company. Yeah. What's going on in your world? What are you seeing as far as candidate experience, good, the bad, and the ugly? So I think my theory on candidate experience is the delta between expectations in the consumer market versus the HR market and thus the HR technology market. Consumer market is arguably always about six to eight years ahead of time. So as a candidate, when I'm working for looking for a big brand or a big tech brand, for example, I expect what you sell to the customers to be the candidate experience that you deliver to me. Mm -hmm. I neglect to think about the fact that your HR teams are arguably six to eight years behind in terms of a technology that they have access to and what they can use. So that experience doesn't feel ancient, doesn't feel antiquated. And all of a sudden you have this delta of expectations at the get-go, even before a recruiter outreach or during a recruiter outreach, that now as a recruiter, you have to figure out how to close or it becomes wider and wider and everything explodes during that salary negotiation mm -hmm. because in absence of everything else, money talks. Mm -hmm. And that's why salary negotiations, in my opinion, are so contentious because you haven't been able to deliver that subconscious expectation of treating a person like a person and treating them in the consumer world and not just the HR world. That's a great take. And, and what I do as a recruiter, every first call we're talking salary. Mm -hmm. And I always set it up as, listen, I'm not looking to pigeonhole you right now. 
I'm just looking for a range because yeah. ultimately it comes down to managing expectations Absolutely. on both sides. And I think when you take that up to the corporate company level from a process standpoint, companies just aren't doing it well. Mm -hmm. There is too much time between phases. There's too much process paralysis around, okay, if they can't go to the next interview because that person's out on vacation, why is it not automatic you have a number two? So when I consult companies, I'm like, always have your interview lineup and have it be interchangeable to keep the process moving. Yeah. Why is this so hard? Why are companies, and we'll say mid-sized organizations yeah. under 5,000 employees, why is it so hard? Why can't they get this right? So you'll be either cringing or just going hallelujah at my next story. I used to work at a manufacturing plant, Panasonic to be specific, and we had a mandate to staff about 4,000 people in under six months. I'm gonna let you appreciate the effort of that. So typically from a process designer perspective and as a consultant, I would go in and say, okay, speed is key because if you don't staff, yeah, you're not producing. Hard. If you don't, you're not producing, you're not making money. You figure out perfection right. afterwards. What happened was the niggly little things of, oh, but this is a director level role, so we need a VP person to interview. VPs block off their calendars, CEOs block off their calendars, et cetera. Yep. And it's insane. So I think part of the whole um, candidate experience on the internal, to your point, process design side is how do you standardize? Because I think one of the biggest challenges HR has is being that tough cookie and saying, we're standardizing. I don't care if you're a president or if you're a line manager. This is a process that we're doing. And I think without that, it's really hard to get the data. Without that, it's really hard to go into the world of AI. But at a high level, if we're going to roll this up, doesn't it come down to making hiring a priority in an organization that comes from the C-suite? Is it that at the end of the day, when the, when the company's, our people are most important, we practice what we preach, mm -hmm. everyone needs to clear their calendar, unless from an urgent meeting, we need to hire these people because otherwise, you know what happens, if there's an open role, someone's doing two roles at a time, Absolutely. and then that causes attrition. And it causes turnover and then it becomes this vicious cycle. I think it's the prioritizing of hiring in the organization, but it's also prioritizing of the hiring process because every business leader I talk to, and I'm sure you as well, when you say how important is hiring or talent acquisition to you, nobody says it's not that important. Everyone says it's one of my top three yeah. priorities, <laughs> but nobody ever thinks about the process that's required to deliver on that priority. It's mm -hmm. not just something that you talk about, but it's something that you have to actively live and practice and prioritize every day. And I think it's that human nature of turning a idea or an aspiration into a habit I like that. that organizations struggle with. And you also have to incorporate your talent team with the business better. Yeah. They have to be part of the process. They have to be in, in, inter, interwoven there. So what's keeping you up at night these days in the HR tech space? Oh my gosh. Not AI. AI is not an option to answer. Here. So I think it's the age old problems that HR has always been facing, right? How do you redesign your processes to be more agile in the changing world? So you don't have to open them up and redesign them every six months because nobody has time for that. How are you collecting data to tell the monetization story? Because let's be real with ourselves for a moment. If you can't get the money, you can't do much in a HR these days. And to get the investment, to get the business dollars focused, you have to show a proof of concept, at least to whatever the CFO values in that moment. And I think the third thing for me is really data. HR people mostly didn't get into HR because they're like, we love math, we love data. I know I didn't. I came into HR because I love the people. I love the engagement part of it. I love the fact that we're bringing everyone together. But data is a huge component today in terms of how you continuously deliver the ability to bring people together. Mm. And it's almost like a linchpin to be able to do the HR work that you love going forward. Give us some alpha here. What are you seeing? What are you hearing? What's up next? What's the next big <laughs> aha innovative <laughs> moment or issue? Um, I let's, think, go issue. let's go to issue. Let's, let's go to issue. Let's go to issue. We already so, talked tech. I think let's all ignore the terms agentic AI for a moment. I think there's so much marketing buzzwords happening in the industry, especially in talent acquisition. That's one part of it. I think the second part of it is thinking about talent as a life cycle. I know a lot of talent acquisition professionals have talked about this for ages, talent management professionals, but how do you raise that to the forefront of HR in terms of when you look at a talent life cycle, Comp benefits, total rewards, and global mobility become support functions. So mm -hmm. if you're really saying you value talent, how are you going to design your HR ecosystem and org chart so that the talent organizations really do become priority and you're prioritizing their needs? And I'm not quite certain that the existing HR operating model, whether you're running on a three-legged stool or some variation thereof, delivers on the promise of talent and the priority of talent. That's some, that's some real talk. <laughs>
That's what we want, folks. You're getting your money's worth here. So speaking of, what is Oops, Did I Think That Out Loud? Let's tell everyone what that is. Yes. So Oops, Did I Think That Out Loud came about a year ago when I was working corporate HR. And I'm sure you've been in those situations where you're sitting in a meeting room and you're having a moment of like, oh my God, I need to say this, but I can't say this because is it just me or is it everybody else? So Oops, Did I Think That Out Loud is my channel of delivering the real talk that happens in my head out to the audience just for everyone to know that you know what there is place for a sanity check you're not the only ones wondering what the heck is going on this is so confusing and no nobody has it together i can definitively say this everyone may look like they have it together but nobody really does love it last but not least my coffee is still not working where i need it to be <laughs> your hot take on return to office right now oh my gosh wfh versus rto <laughs> I think it's whatever the business needs. I, from a investor perspective and from a business lens, I, I appreciate it. I get where their CEOs are coming from. You got to return shareholder interest. You got to invest in it. And cost cutting and possibly revenue is only two ways that you can do this. From an employee perspective, I can also understand yanking me out of my pajamas like for five days all of a sudden. I, I don't like Zoom it. Call I in my office. It. Exactly. So I think it's about maintaining that level of humanity in the face of business interest and being able to balance the conversations. And I think this is where a lot of HR professionals jobs come in, really being able to say, yes, appreciate the business interest. Here's how we can bridge it or here's how we can roadmap to get you there, as opposed to putting you on a headline newspaper mm -hmm. and making a huge deal out of it. I love it. Lydia Wu, everybody. Lydia, where can folks find you? Where can they connect? Where can they learn more? Yes, LinkedIn or Instagram. Whoops, did I think that out loud? And I'll be around every week. Awesome. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure for having Cool. Wisdom is forever. But for us, it's time to go. Thank you for joining us. Luckily, we'll be back with our next episode soon. Jam-packed with more incredible humans. Thank you for listening, subscribing, and sharing. To join the conversation, search The Pausecast on LinkedIn. And to catch up on past episodes and more info, please visit www.thepausecast.com.